Welcome back to Two Gals in a Glass Half Full. Today we are continuing our conversation um, on sleep. So last time we talked about just sleep in general, and today we're going to look at kind of the effects of when we get lack of sleep or chronic lack of sleep as well. Uh, but first, Dr. Jess, what do you have in your cup? Uh, so Dr. Bobby, I have moved on to my second cup of coffee for <laughs> <laughs> the sleep series um, because I did not get great sleep last night. So I don't know that I would recommend just like caffeinating, like overly caffeinating, <laughs> but like it's a strategy that I'm going to implement today. So, <laughs> um, so Dr. Bobby, what's in your glass? I am, ha I am on to some water. So just getting that H2O. Awesome. And for everybody that did not hear the first episode in June for sleep series, this is Dr. Erica Kiernan. She is a former professor of ours and she teaches neuroscience. So when we are doing episodes on different topics, we like to speak to people that more know more than we do about topics. And then we all learn together. So Dr. Kiernan, what's in your class? Um, I would like to say water that I'm being helpful <laughs> and like healthy, but I'm actually drinking coffee, my black coffee. <laughs> because okay. I, that's the one beverage I really cannot live without this coffee. So yeah. I'm, I'm addicted to it, but I have very few vices in life and mm -hmm. I'm okay with that one. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's the real answer, right? Is that it, you don't have to be perfect. And, you know, we call it the 80, 20 rule. As long as like 80% of the time we're yep. doing pretty well with our choices, then the 20%, like that's okay. Oh, right. <laughs> Do yes. it. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> unless it's going to cause harm to somebody else don't do that but like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's that would be the that's don't the pass no right don't yeah, have yeah. <laughs> Uh, so what we talked about in the first episode is the intro into sleep. What is sleep? What's involved in the sleep cycles? And uh, physiologically, kind of what is happening with brain waves and the different, um, you know, in one, in two, in three, into REM sleep. So that is really helpful to start the conversation and get a, a base knowledge of sleep. Now, we know that recommendations are that we should get seven to nine hours of sleep as an adult. However, this is something of qualitative sleep as well. It's not just, it's not just quantitative, meaning the amount of hours, it's the quality of the sleep that you're getting during that time. Meaning if you're not staying asleep the entire time and you're up for a couple of hours in the middle of the night, or maybe you're in bed, but having a difficult time getting to sleep, and so what this can lead to is this chronic sleep deprivation. The other reasons why that might happen, maybe you just aren't getting to bed at a, a regular time, or maybe um, you're having to get up way too early for different things that um, might be work or, you know, things that might be in your life. And so over this, you know, months and months and months of time, like you're not getting this adequate amount of sleep. And so that's what we call more of that chronic sleep deprivation which is different than acute. Now, acute sleep deprivation would be more of like, you know, like Dr. Kiernan's flight and she <laughs> has like a ton of delays and um, yeah. didn't get into the hotel until like early hours of the morning and then still have to be up in the morning. So, you know, if something happens for one day, that's going to be a lot different than something that happens um, chronically or like on a daily basis. And so that's what we want to talk about in this episode is kind of the differences between acute sleep deprivation and then chronic sleep deprivation. And then what we can learn from that in order to maybe make some better choices and implement some better strategies into our lives. Mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Kiernan, as from your perspective, <clears throat> how is our brain impacted with um, this lack of sleep or poor sleep? And, and you could speak to acutely or chronically, wherever you want to start with it. So um, sleep disturbance or sleep deprivation, especially if it's more on a chronic level, you're, you're going to see kind of similar types of things happen, but more severity when you're dealing with more chronic deprivation. So when you're, so there's a hypothesis that when you are awake, when you're biologically not prepared to be awake. So, you know, your, your body saying it needs sleep. It needs like that restoration. It needs like that detox state of sleep and cell repair and all the stuff that's going on in your body. But you're awake, um, whether it be from a multitude fragmented sleep, 
you know, disturbed sleep, not seeming to get good quality of sleep. The, the hypothesis is there's something called hypofrontality, which is this area of the brain in the front of the brain that deals with cognition. And that means that hypo mean it's, it's low, it's this lowered or diminished executive function. So that's why you feel kind of out of it and you can't think correctly. Or I know when, if, you know, I have maybe a few bad nights, like I'll forget things. Or you were, you were saying, um, Dr. Jess, a story about like, where did I put my phone? <laughs> <laughs> the podcast, right? You're probably tired. And it's just like, you just set it down and you're like, oh my gosh, I just had that. So you're not able to have good executive function. However, it can get even worse, especially with chronic deprivation. And there's been lots of um, studies that have identified lack of sleep and sleep disturbances for risk factors like suicidal ideation because this hypofrontality of the brain, we have this kind of diminished executive function and it's a common pathway to suicidal ideation and behavior because when we're tired, we tend to react more emotionally. Um, we tend to think more negatively about ourselves and we are definitely more vulnerable to stress. So, it is, it really does a number like chronic sleep deprivation really does a number on our brain. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's also other interesting physiological effects as well. There's studies that have to do with the fact that loss of sleep, and especially when we're talking about like chronic deprivation, we see a, um, a lowering of pain thresholds. So our body actually experiences pain, um, I guess, easier if we lack sleep. So we have pain pathways being disturbed. Um, then there's also, um, it's not just our brain, but it's how our brain interacts with our cardiovascular system. So this can be, you know, lack of sleep is not just, a, you know, affecting how we think and how our memories are and, and how we're functioning, but it's really also affecting multitudes uh, of systems in our body and leads to cardio, like an increased cardiovascular risk because we have chronic sleep deprivation. We have things like an increased sympathetic activity. That's our fight or flight, kind of that our heart rate's going up, right? Mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, you know, being in a stressful situation. So we have an altered stress response. Um, we also have um, a increased inflammatory response occurring in our body, um, metabolic dysfunction, and all of that leads to an increase in cardiovascular risk. So truly lack of sleep and sleep deprivation, um, can kill you. <laughs> I mean, it's affecting yeah. your heart. Um, so, you know, it's, that's why sleep is so important because a lot of people just think, oh, I'm sleepy. I'm not thinking straight. I just, you know, get some sleep. But if you, if you're constantly doing it or that's happening to your body, um, it's doing damage to multiple systems within your body. I find like when I have enough sleep and multiple days of, you know, doing well, um, I can take on a lot more stress, but not feel it the same way. And then the days where you lack sleep and like one thing goes wrong and you're just like, oh, and it's almost like, why can't I handle this? Um, I also find I eat a lot worse when I'm hung, like when I have a lack of sleep, I like just crave stuff I wouldn't normally eat. Yeah. And that probably has a lot to do as well with where a lot of those, um, that information about sleep pathways and how like REM, not um, non-REM sleep is coming from. So this is area in the brain, the hypothalamus and your hypothalamus, um, there is, it, it's actually, it's kind of divided into two separate portions and it, it lives kind of next to the brain stem, like right, right above the brain stem, um, deep in the brain. And this little hypothalamus area, it has an anterior and a posterior portion. And one portion deals with like hormone release and all that good stuff. And then the other portion has a lot of neural circuitry, which is helping with your sleep wake cycles. But also 
um, controls things like blood pressure or satiation, like being satiated for eating. So if you have all this neural circuitry that's living really close together and all these like little nuclei crammed together in this hypothalamus area that are dealing with like feelings of hunger or feeling full and circadian rhythms um, and helping with your, your phases of sleep. If that has been, if one of those systems like sleep is not occurring correctly, it would kind of make sense that what lives next door to it isn't working very well either. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, there is a lot of association um, with that, you know, and, and let's face it also, cognitively you're not making yes good decisions yeah. right it's kind of all it's all combined it's all connected you know in a way yep. yeah and I, I think as physical therapists we see this a good amount in the clinic so the aspect of pain and sleep and so this is one of the first things I try and address with any patient that has a significant amount of pain they come in and there is that like, they're just much more emotional. Like oftentimes they'll be crying. They're like, I don't know why I'm crying. This is, I'm super embarrassed right now. And I call it the judgment-free zone, right? So I'm not here to judge you. That's not what this is about. What this is about is trying to like meet you where you are to make sure that, um, you know, we're helping you um, to meet your goals. And so the first goal is you need to sleep. Like we have to figure out how to get you sleeping because if we can get you sleeping, you are going to feel a lot better your pain's gonna be more manageable, your emotional state's going to be better, and you're gonna get back to doing what you want to do a lot faster. So that's one of the very first things that I set up is like, how are you sleeping? In what position are you sleeping? What's working, what's not working, and let's make those changes. And that's like very first day eval day. Um, because I know for me, <laughs> if I don't sleep well, I come in and I am not as resilient to anything, right? Like mm. I'm not, and I'm not even in pain. So now you add pain to that. And then that resiliency, just like, I mean, it's just like the steep downhill, like it is just not good. And then that tap starts tapping into chronic pain, right? So this can happen acutely after a surgery or, you know, some sort of injury, but then chronically, this is a really, really big topic that needs to be addressed right away. And then you start seeing this, like, you know, all of the other things that go into treatment as well, but making sure that we can get that at least, at least some qualitative sleep, some is going to be a huge win into getting the ball rolling. And we call that that snowball effect, right? So like, like we celebrate every small win because then as it snowballs, that's where we start getting the traction of actually getting fully better. Um, but yeah, the, it's, it, I, we just don't really truly, I think, value the amount of um, importance that sleep gives our bodies until we really start to study it and learn more about it. And then we're like, well, no wonder, like, yeah. no wonder I'm not doing well on my diet plan or no wonder I'm not doing well and whatever these other things might be. It's like, well, I'm not sleeping well. So then we've got to figure out why, right? And that, mm -hmm. that's different for everybody. There's no one or one right or wrong answer. Um, but like understanding the why is going to help then move forward with whatever the goals you might have. Mm -hmm. So I love how no. you said, I love how you said like, that's the first thing you'd address with your patients. Cause I think sometimes in our profession, we focus so much on tissue, like what we see and we forget about the new, and we've already talked a little bit about this, but the nutrition part and the sleep part mm -hmm. and the like mental well being part, cause that all plays such a role into, um, like physical therapy and getting better and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's one of those things as physical therapists too. I, it's not the first thing we think of because as physical therapists, we are movement science experts. So we're not, you know, we're not moving quote unquote when we're asleep, right? <laughs> so it doesn't, it's not a state we usually typically think of. Um, and I'm, I'm an occupational therapist as well. And I feel like we spoke a little bit more about sleep when I was an occupational therapist because it was really identified as a crucial activity um, activity of daily living mm -hmm. and a crucial function, but you're exactly right. It, it feeds on itself. And when you have a patient as a therapist, who's in pain and that patient's in pain, the pain is leading them to not sleep well, right. they don't sleep well. So then they're more receptive and they're at a higher level of feeling that pain, but right. so they don't sleep well. And so I think it's so important, so excellent to see, like you were saying about, you know, 
that's one of the first things I ask my patient. Um, and even though medications are not in our scope, this is why a lot of sleep medications are um, given to patients, not just in the hospital, but to take home also pain medication, making sure that's adhered to. Um, sometimes I, when I was practicing, I would have patients that don't want to take, like they don't want to take their sleep medicine and they don't want to take their pain medicine. You know, they don't want to be what they consider, like, I don't want to get addicted or they Mm -hmm. feel like it's a crutch. Um, when I'm kind of like, but it's important that you take your medications for what they've been prescribed because it all fits together. It's a a jigsaw puzzle, right? And if you're not like putting in that correct puzzle piece, it's not all going to it, you know, you're not going to get the full picture. So it's really important. I think sometimes with education of our patients, why these medications are given and why sleep isn't so important. It's a daily function. It's one of the most important functions of our lives. So, um, you know, I, I just, I think it's wonderful when, when therapists kind of physical therapists, especially like start to think about that aspect and like it, truthfully, I don't understand why we couldn't write goals about it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I do. I, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I include it in goals because that's going to be measurable, right? Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. I mean, it's still a subjective response. I'm not going in there like measuring your sleep, you know, but like right. still it's a functional goal um, that, that I add in all the time because then it's forcing me to remember to ask about it as well, <laughs> right? It yeah. keeps yeah. me accountable because it's in my yeah. plan of care. Yeah, especially with post-op and chronic pain patients, you know, yeah. um, I feel yeah, like those they're are the affected two. the most. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I was, yeah, I, I use the example of um, sleep deprivation is actually a way of torture, right? Yep. So that is, that is a way that people can torture another human is mm-hmm. to keep them awake. And so mm-hmm. when I, when I phrase it that way, they're like, oh, <laughs> like, yes, like, I'm not like, I'm not trying to make something bigger than it is, I promise. Mm-hmm. But like, this, this is a way to torture people. And right now, where I'm meeting you seems like you're in, you're close to that, right? Yeah. This is, this is kind of suffering right now. And we're, I think we're actually in suffering. And so yeah. let's figure out ways that we can get out of that. And it's just, it's, it's just so funny how we devalue it. Um, yeah. but like, but yeah, it is a form of torture. I mean, I haven't done it myself, but I do watch movies. Okay. So like, <laughs> I'm, I'm educated in this. <laughs> exactly. I, I saw yeah. it in a movie and, but it is, yeah. true. it is, it is, it is absolutely yeah. true because it's kind of going back to the form of torture in, is that they, it psychologically does drive people towards, you know, almost feeling insanity, right? Because they, they are having the more of the, those suicidal ideations, they're more emotional Mm -hmm. and, um, it it can literally drive you crazy, but it also on a physiological level is kind of increasing your risk for just, you know, mortality Mm -hmm. because it's affecting those other body systems as well. Right which is what we talked about in our stress series. So we did a whole month on stress and the hormonal components of stress, acute stress versus chronic stress and sleep deprivation taps right into that chronic stress. And Mm -hmm. so, and then all of the um, cascade of effects that happens with that. And so again, a lot of the series that we're talking about all do kind of blend in together because our body systems do all interrelate. And Mm so again, the more that we understand how they interrelate, the better we value them, the more that we value them, then we can make better educated decisions about how we implement strategies in our day-to-day lives. Um, Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make any, you don't have to make these huge drastic changes, but having the awareness can be like, oh, wow, maybe that's part of why I'm having difficulty with my interpersonal communication right? Maybe mm-hmm. I am being a little bit more on the emotional side of my response and not as logical, which is why my partner is having a hard time communicating back with me. Maybe there is something to this, which mm-hmm. is what we talked in mental health awareness month of interpersonal <laughs> communication yes. and how to use, you know, the we statements and how to say, instead of, but use and 
um, to take some of that emotional, like just boom, like firing it right back and like take that back. But again, if we're sleep deprived, it's going to be really hard to have the awareness because that emotional response is just going to want to kick right back out, which is the you statement of pointing that finger, which then starts that cascade of effects. So um, this one that this is where I got, I've been so excited about the sleep month because it really connects a lot of what we've been talking about, um, which is, which is very fun, <clears throat> fun to understand, not fun to experience. <laughs> that was not the best way to say it. Um, yeah, I think it does. Uh, well, like you were saying with communication, um, I mean, they've even done studies where like with between partners and people that sleep apart, like have their mm-hmm. own sleep areas actually have kind of almost better relationships in a way Interesting. because they're not waking each other up and they're both partners are getting good restorative sleep. Um, So it's, and of course, you know, all the intimacy and being together and everything, um, you know, oh, you sleep apart, something much must be wrong. But some, some people have made that decision because they know that they function better, they communicate better. um, And they're just like a better partner when, when Mm -hmm. they're get a good night's sleep. Oh, absolutely. I know, I know a number of people that do that. And my grandparents did as well for the longest time. Um, And not because, I mean, they had a wonderful marriage, but again, it was just like, they just had better sleep if they mm-hmm. had their own separate areas. And plus they were on different circadian rhythms as well. And so, you know, like, it's like, you know, my grandfather would he'd fall asleep a lot earlier and would wake up a lot earlier. Whereas my grandmother was more like me, like that 10, 10 30, you know, into mm-hmm. 7 a.m. So like, but they had a great marriage. So it was just kind of um, something that I guess I perceived as normative but then other people maybe may not perceive that as normative. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh no, they loved each other very much. Like we yeah. should have seen them together. They're great. So, um, yeah. they just want a good sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. and I get that. Yeah. I find because I'm not married and don't have a significant other, I've slept alone most of my life with my two dogs, of course, or a dog at any point. And so <laughs> I notice with them, like I almost sleep better when they're there, but then if I do have to share a bed for any reason, um, I like don't sleep at all. Like I'm up almost the whole night. I'm like so aware of what, where I am and what I'm doing. So I always joke if, when I get married, like I'm going to need that like King, maybe the extra big King yeah. size bed yeah. so that we we're in the same place, but I still feel like I have my own space. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm all about the King size bed because oh, yeah. I like to spread out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I need to have my, my space. And, and yeah. on my pillows, because I have to have a pillow nest, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think any physical therapist has a pillow nest. It's like I've got yeah. I've got all of my support pillows to make sure that my hips, my shoulder, my neck, yes. my low back <laughs> perfect are alignment. all in perfect alignment. Exactly. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna walk the walk, okay? Yeah. Because yes. you're gonna stay yeah. in, you're gonna stay in that position all night, that one yeah. position with all those pillows. Exactly. I'm like all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> My husband sleeps like he's in a coffin. He's just like <laughs> sleeps on his back, which doesn't help with the snoring factor. You know, that's mm-hmm. another thing. You know, if you have yeah. partners and somebody is a snorer, you know, that that's gonna keep disrupt your cycle um, mm-hmm. of sleep. So it's um and, and of course, excessive snoring is also a sign of, of something maybe physiological going on. I mean, mm-hmm. also people that sleep an extended period of time. So not just lack of sleep, but sleeping too much can lead and disrupt the same pathways and lead to um, more suicidal ideation as well. Mostly because extended sleep, too much sleep could be an underlying factor of another diagnosis, more severe diagnosis going on. It's kind of a chicken in the egg. Some, it, it, when you kind of, when I was looking at some of the sleep literature, it's like, okay, are they not sleeping well because of this diagnosis um, or them not sleeping well led to this diagnosis? Mm-hmm. So I think there's an interplay there as well, or they, they're sleeping too long and is it because they have this diagnosis or you know is it the opposite way so it's 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 really interesting it's kind of a sweet you got to get that sweet spot not too much not too little right yeah that totally makes sense 
So, uh, Dr. Erica, what are, so as we're learning about like kind of chronic sleep deprivation, what are some like signs that we can look for in ourselves to see if maybe our sleeping patterns or sleeping health isn't quite as well as it could be? Um, pro probably, you know, any number of things that we've kind of discussed before, but I think noticing things like, um, you, you aren't tending to wake up on kind of a natural rhythm. So, um, we spoke about us kind of, I wake up before my alarm, you know, I, that's my mm -hmm. rhythm. But if you are waking up to an alarm and you're constantly pushing snooze, snooze, okay. snooze, snooze, snooze that might be an indication that something within your sleep wake cycle needs to be adjusted a little bit. Then I think everybody gets up and well, I'm not going to say everybody. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm one of those people I get up and don't talk to me like the first hour. I need to sip my coffee. I need to sit. I need to contemplate life. I, <laughs> I need to randomly scroll through my phone or read an article. I slowly wake up to my day. Some people, I can sometimes I feel like my husband's like this. He can literally like step out of bed and he's like, and I'm awake. <laughs> you know? That's me. That's Happy me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I should definitely do that. <laughs> so there's a spectrum, but I think if you are getting up and you know, you are you're tired, that's natural, but that that tired feeling that continual like um kind of cognitive diminished executive function is lasting well into the day might even feel like it's getting a little bit worse and you know you are so tired that it's like you've only been out of bed for two hours but you're just like dreaming of when you get to go back to bed kind of thing um it that you know that that should be a sign and then you know just throughout the day if you are tasked to do something cognitive in your job on a daily basis, I know, um, especially uh, this was probably more apparent when, when my children were younger and I had a lot of fragmented sleep, just like where you might be right now, Dr. Jess, yeah. <laughs> I noticed like, I was just not a sharp. I was not as sharp during the day. Um, we talk about like baby brain, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's like a real thing. There's multitudes of it, you know, but we, we, we're in a fog, um, and you feel like you're in a fog mm -hmm. and, um, I would forget things. And I just felt like I was not on my A game. Uh, I'd miss details. Um, and you know, if you're feeling like that's the case or you're feeling highly emotional or you feel like you're always in a negative state, this is where the suicidal ideation is really important and recognizing signs of that um, is if you're always feeling like you're in this negative activity mode, constant and directed at yourself, um, not just others, but yourself and feeling very emotional, um, then it might be some signs that you need to address your, your, what they call like your sleep hygiene and, and like, mm -hmm. how can I improve this? Because just keeping in mind, going back to what we said before, it's just like not a mental thing. It's a full body of system. So, um, you know, we've all been a little tired in the morning, we get our coffee and then we move on. But if that's just lasting for forever and you start making multiple mistakes during your day that, you know, is mm -hmm. not typical, then yes, let's look at what you're saying. <laughs> let's look at your sleep patterns. Yeah. And I think it's important to like recognize that there are mental health counselors out there that you could talk to if you are feeling super negative. Um, mm -hmm. If you, if it's not necessarily the negativity, but you feel like you're just having a hard time with staying asleep, right? Like you go to sleep, but can't stay asleep. Well, there's all sorts of different things that could be contributing to that. Like, you know, it could be sleep apnea, there could be other things. Mm -hmm. And so there's, sleep studies that you can actually participate in to figure out what's going on. Um, so there's like, there's a number of different resources out there to really get some further um, assistance with making sure that you're able to get that quality and quantity of sleep that you need. Um, if it's not something as simple as really checking your schedule. <laughs> so like, mm, yes. are you yeah. on your phone for like an extended yeah. period with that light in your eyes? Um, things like that, that could be keeping you awake longer than you really should be. Um, 
or whatever your your nighttime routine might be. There might just need to be some changes that you make to kind of start that winding down a little bit earlier. If, if those simple strategies, positioning when you're sleeping like that, like if those simple strategies aren't working, then it, it is time to say, okay, like I need some help with this. I need to figure out what could be going on. And there's plenty of professionals out there that are, are trained in these different areas. Um, but it's, you know, I think it's definitely something important to say, like, if it's not a simple fix, like keep looking into it and um, ask questions and ask questions to those around you. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that, I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes that outside, that outside opinion or outside opinion, outside perspective can just look and be like, even though you may not feel like you're doing too much, they could be like, you just have, like, you can't fit everything that you have planned for the day, you know, in a 24 hour time period, like, kind of, and then helping you figure out where you can move things, what you can take out and like how to prioritize what's going on, which is a lot of what we talked about last month too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Just some of that planning. Um, so uh, I think, I think our last question is, so let's say, that, you know, we're making these changes, right? And we're like, okay, like I'm really gonna commit to like being more consistent with my circadian rhythm. I'm gonna really try and like um, get this like, instead of like four hours one night, six hours another night, nine hours one night, back to four, you know? So mm -hmm. like this, like all over the place. So let's say like, I'm actually committing to this. Um, how, like how quickly um, should, should our body start to recover, you know? So like, you know, cause that's like, you know, it's not this like amount of like, oh, I had this all nighter because I was on a plane overnight and blah, blah, blah. And therefore I had to sleep 14 hours in order to recover from that. Um, I used to think that like, you know, <laughs> especially with traveling when I was younger, um, I'm like, oh my gosh, like what's going to happen? Like I, like I didn't sleep at all. So, but I don't have 14 hours to, to catch up, but like, yeah. I'll get like maybe nine and you're like, boom, let's yeah. do this. Um, but again, that was only like one night that I really didn't sleep at all. So <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's not like we can collect like credits of sleep too. Right, right. You know, right. I think that's the, the thing. It's like, it's really, you know, just because we got 10 one night doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're going to be good on like three right. <laughs> you <know? laughs> right. um, or, you know, you hear, I need to catch up on my sleep. Right. Um, you're not going to catch up as in account for the deficit that you had before mm -hmm. um you're just truly trying to get like that one good night of restorative sleep for that mm -hmm. point in time and moving mm -hmm. forward but you're not making up from like what was missed in the past if that makes right. sense yeah so it's not like you don't just like add up the hours and be like okay yeah, yeah we're good now <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah everything's great <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was always confused like by that right like I'm like wow how do I feel so much better this is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> the good part of that, it sounds like though, you can, if you make that conscious effort to change, you can feel the benefits pretty quickly mm -hmm. of, you know, instead of having to wait to accumulate the amount of hours you miss, you start feeling it pretty quickly, um, yes. which is also um, that instant gratification we always our society loves is yes yeah. yes getting a good night's sleep um or you know any amount of sleep that's that's restorative you're going to feel pretty immediate results now knowing that you have effect on other body systems as well you know that takes a little bit longer to recover mm -hmm. but you're you you definitely um will feel more immediate effects of feeling just an overall feeling better yeah right you, we're able to get that sleep. Yeah, awesome. Um, all right, well, Dr. Kiernan, thank you so much for coming on yeah, to our you. show. We really appreciate all of the knowledge that you were able to share with us. And this is something that, again, our listeners, we're just trying to kind of connect the dots to make sure that people are having um, improved knowledge and just through conversation and hopefully that can be helpful. So we will be continuing to interview um, some other interview, uh, individuals this week and um, well, rather this month. And uh, we've got a nurse that's gonna be coming on that works the night shift. And so oh. talking with her about how does she balance that, right? Cause she's got night shift work, but then switches to days and she's got kids. And mm -hmm. so really trying to see what kind of strategy she implements. And uh, Dr. Bobby and I are going to be talking about just from a physical therapist perspective, right? So like um, some mm -hmm. of the positioning yeah. techniques that you can use to be mm -hmm. kind of helpful for mm -hmm. addressing some of the pain components that, that uh, limit our sleep. 
And then we'll be talking with another individual that does a lot of traveling and working with, with um, athletes and performers that have to pick up and travel like from one city to the next. So there's like a lot of disruption in you know, the, where they're sleeping, when they're sleeping and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. And what do, what are their strategies to implement when you have that more on the go type of uh, schedule? So yeah. we're really going to try and hit a number of different topics, but starting off with the big picture is always super helpful to lay that context for what we're about to talk um, about mm-hmm. next. Um, so you so make sure to mm-hmm. good sleep hygiene. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, power everything down. Um, mm-hmm. I, I do it. I look at my phone. That I should not be doing that, especially with the LED light coming in my little eyeballs, because right. all of that is waking everything up. So you know, right. they talk about like kind of just powering down everything prior to going to bed, getting away from light sources, whether it means um you know, taking down the temperature of the room of what you sleep in, you don't want to be Mm -hmm. too hot. Um, You know, taking the time to stay away from like, like sources, but read, if you do activities, no activities should really go on in your bed, like your bed should just be sleep. So Mm -hmm. we've never had a TV in our bedroom. Um, And I'm glad of that because that's one of the problems when I'm in a hotel, I'll watch like a TV, I'll watch the TV. And that it's, like visually exciting um so so many things that you can do to try to kind of just set yourself up for a good night's sleep um and whatever even if it's like taking a nice warm shower before you go to bed like some that's just like okay calm down (laughs) calm down ready for sleep now (laughs) awesome so stay tuned for next week everybody bye